Ladies and gentlemen, peoples of all types, children of all ages, humans and non-humans, let's get ready for Sports Conspirators! Welcome to Sports Conspirators. I'm Braden. I'm Andrew. And today we're talking about the controversy, the controversy <laughs> surrounding the 1995 Rugby uh, World Cup. Now, see, I, at first I was like, okay, listen, rugby, is that in our headspace? Is this going to be something we're going to be super knowledgeable on? But, you know, I'm, I think combining both our expertise in this situation is perfect because, like, I don't want to say I'm a rugby expert, but I've played it. I know the sport. I've played it. I love it. It's great. And you have shit your pants lots of times. So yes. I feel like you know yes. a lot about I was poisoning, wondering how right? you were going with this. And I'm yeah, like, okay, like, yes, yes. We are, in fact, both subject matter experts. Yeah, like I know rugby, you know incontinence. Yes, it's fucking, 100%. Like, yeah, it's fine. Um, I was going to say, I, no, I don't know a lot about rugby. I only played once, uh, not for me. I'll tell you right it. now that it drives me nuts because how many out of like for how long we've been friends, how long have I been telling you that rugby is actually should be your sport for a long time. You're the, you are the perfect build for a rugby, but like you're, you're so sneaky fast and like people, obviously if you don't know Braden from the other show, you don't know him as well, but dude, break, he's pretty brick shit out six foot, you six know, foot, guys running two thirty. Yeah, and I, I'm and like you, a crocodile on land. You wouldn't buddy, expect it to be as fast as it is, but I'd, I'd you'll say raise those eyebrows. Spring, buddy, I'd say you're more of a springbok. Yeah. Gazellish. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I'll say like with the 1995 World Cup, at first I wasn't sure. I was like, oh, I don't really know about this. And then I was like, oh, I do know about this. Because, Absolutely. Uh, th there was the movie In Invictus. Yeah, Matt Damon. Yeah, Matt Damon. And... Uh, it's one of those stories where it's like there's very few times where, you know, sport, like something transcends sports. And this was just one of those stories. Uh, you had, you know, this nation divided, basically uniting behind uh, this team. Um, well, yeah, because okay, let's put it this way. So you have Nelson Mandela, who he became right right before this he became the country's first democratically elected president right and this is a country that was fucking struggled with apartheid for i don't know how many years before that right oh like, yeah and <sighs> there's a huge divide between you know white south africans and black south africans well, not even just black south africans just any type of any type of we classify north america as a minority but the crazy thing about this is in south africa the whites were the minority Mm -hmm. But still, they were, let's say, maybe the ruling caste. And with basically with apartheid, there was sanctions. There was sanctioned racial se uh, segregation. Segrega segregation? Segregation, yeah. They couldn't basically, like, minorities uh, couldn't work. Like, couldn't get job. Like, couldn't hold good jobs, be in positions of power. Unbelievably racist times. Horrible times. And Nelson Mandela was one of the main symbols fighting this. One of the, like, He was the figurehead. And spoiler alert, when South Africa went on to win the 1995 uh, Rugby World Cup by three points after extra time, you know, who was standing there in a Springbok jersey, the symbol of South Africa's rugby team, presenting them with, oh, fuck, is it the Ellis Cup? Uh -huh. Ooh, I'm going to butcher it. I know it's Ellis Park Stadium, but anyways, presenting the Rugby World Cup to South Africa. Like, what a symbol. Like, in that's... And the Springboks, like the rugby team, had been long seen as a, like a little bit of the like of a face for like the racist culture there because it was they're you know, all white guys, they're all white guys and stuff. And and Nelson Mandela, you know, basically came out and was like, hey, like we can use this sport to like unite the country. So he came out, um, you know, at the beginning of the game in a Springbok jersey, you know, basically breaking down that barrier and saying like, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, where we're from, we can all unite. Uh, in this, behind this team so you, you look at this story like of uniting a nation and stuff and it's like you you think about you know there's times where you know you'll see fighters who have a story that you're like they're unbeatable that night they're absolutely unbeatable and the story the, it you know as much as it's not a cinderella story because south africa is fucking was good 
Um, but I mean, they're facing the All Blacks, who are I don't know a lot about rugby, but I do know the All Blacks are the greatest rugby team uh, that's ever lived, and that will continue on forever. I will say this: the Springboks, South Africa, were the second best team in this tournament. All right, the All Blacks were the better team. Yeah, and you're gonna say, "Oh, how is that? How is that the case?" Because you know, Springboks won. The All Blacks lost. I'm talking like you. Everything leading up to this final, you've got Jonah Lamu just fucking going absolutely ballistic against England. You've got Jeff Wilson, the Golden Boy. Like I, I'm a little bit, you know, I'm a little bit more prone to watch the wing because that's where I played. But like, we have some of the best rugby players in the history of rugby playing on this team, and they made fucking easy work of everyone else that they came in contact with in this tournament. Like this looked like it was going to be a clear and away victory for the all blacks. Yeah. And it's, it's again, it's, it's so as much as it seems like a Cinderella story, it's not, they weren't the worst team in terms of their second best, but a distant second. But it, you know what? I, we'd say Cinderella story this is more snow white. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why? Well, let's get into it. A lot of the controversy, behind the reason why South Africa won is because there are, <laughs> many believe the All Blacks were poisoned two days before the World Cup. And, you know, it's wild to me because it's, it's this big Cinderella story. You got Morgan Freeman playing Nelson Mandela. You got Matt Damon. You got this beautiful movie that's just united the fuck, you know, united South Africa and everybody's happy. And then you get into the nitty gritty of it. And we're about to share a story with you. And if you come away from away from the story like we do, I'm I'm full full team poison here. Oh, without a doubt, <laughs> without team a doubt. poison. There's not a doubt in my mind. I yeah. mean, if, if the so let's get into it. So leading up into the final week uh, of the Rugby World Cup, um, the All Blacks team made a decision which would end up costing them greatly, and that decision was to stay in Johannesburg uh, for the in the lead up. There was talks amongst management to, you know, kind of get out of the city and stuff. And there was many reasons for this. One is because f fucking rugby is huge here. And it's in the middle of the R World Cup. These guys are like celebrities walking down the street. Everyone knows them. The second, so they wanted to get the team out of Johannesburg. They thought maybe let's get the team out of Johannesburg so we can, you know, we're, we're out of the limelight. Secondly, was there were serious concerns uh, about some of their players being attacked? Um, what, what's the what's their main guy's name again? Joan Alamu. Like, yeah, they they, they were worried he was going to be stabbed. There was they had to have security detail on him at all times because there were serious concerns that some you better use a big knife. Yeah, That's some all crazy. You better fan. use a big fucking knife because if you stab that guy and you don't kill him, oh my god. Yeah. He, it, but there was there was serious concern that a crazed fan was going to uh, attack him in the lead up. The, there was like the, there was like the the running like joke in the country at the time was like the whole country is going to have to tackle him. Like if yeah. you see him, take him out because he's going to take out your team. Absolutely, and like another thing that's really important to touch on. Like I don't know how common knowledge this is. It might be common knowledge, but South Africa is one of the most dangerous countries in the world. Like violence wise, like it is, I work with people, I, there's, I work with some South African paramedics and like they're from South Africa and they're like every single house has fucking fortress walls and barbed wire, right? Like this is a fucking wild place. Yeah. And so these guys, they decide to just stay in Johannesburg and leading up to it. I mean, they had security detail and, and, and and their hotel had special instructions that no calls could be made to players' rooms. Calls would have to go through a switchboard and then basically get denied unless it was from other team or team members' families. Well, as soon as it was basically announced that it's, if, you know, it's, it's South Africa uh, versus the All Blacks, all of a sudden, some of these security measures seem to just kind of like fall to the wayside. And very quickly... Uh, everyone in Johannesburg knew where the All Blacks were staying because they were doing news reports about it. Oh, they're staying here. Uh, the All Blacks are staying here. They said giving out their room numbers. Yeah. <laughs> and, 
and all of a sudden the all blacks are receiving calls at all hours and they're getting like very graphic death threats death like, threats we're getting we're talking like car alarms going out outside their fucking uh, their windows all night non-stop yeah. relentless they're they're calling security and of the hotel and being like hey like seriously like can you guys get out there and do something about the car alarms or anything they're like nope so no nope, we can't and now other than these the death threats and the phone calls everything's kind of going pretty normal they're practicing regularly you know everybody's kind of staying fit they're getting dialed in and we're going to start this probably it's about two days before the tournament so i think this is a thursday okay and the, the gm of the all backs um meads we'll call them and five players who weren't going to be playing in the tournament so guys who were either injured or just not you know wasn't weren't going to make the playing roster uh decided to go out for a dinner for a dinner and Maine's the manager, you know, started to make it halfway through his his entree and realizes like he's just getting overcome with with nausea and feeling weak and just everybody's kind of commenting I'm like, my man, like you look super pale, you don't look well. Um, and this is this was surprising because you know like a lot of these guys around him are also starting to look a little bit shitty and these are like peak athletes and you're like, well, this doesn't look right. Like these guys shouldn't really be. You know what I mean? Looking like shit. These are thoroughbred athletes. And they all kind of pile onto the team bus that took them out for dinner and make it back. And then, like, without even making it into the lobby back of their hotel room, we're talking, like, projectile vomit, painting this lobby. And they're like, okay, something's not right. Let's, let's get this guy up to see the team doctor. Let's get him his own room. Let's take care of him. And when they make it up to the team doctor, they find basically like a fucking emergency room fucking, you know, the doctor sitting there, he's, he's jabbing guys with anti-emetics, like gravel and whatnot. There's guys with IVs going. And this, this team room is filled with sick athletes. Yeah. Violently ill coming out both ends. Some guys can't even make it to the toilet. Uh, <laughs> unbelievably ill. So we're talking like this, this is as of like two o'clock on Friday morning. So two 30 in the morning, 36 before 36 hours before the actual final. All right. We've got 26 out of 37 players on this roster. Sicker than sick. We're talking 80%, like 80% down violently ill coming out both ends. Super like, you know what I mean? You can get, food poisoning or whatever type of, you know, we're, we'll speculate like this, th these can set off like you're, you, you're having massive fluid loss, right? When you have diarrhea and you're vomiting, this could induce hypovolemia really quick. Like if you, this isn't treated, like this is fucking sick. You are extremely dehydrated at this point if you're not being treated, right? Like people get hospitalized for these types of symptoms all the time and fucking 26 members of this team, this team who's supposed to be competing for the World Cup in 36 hours. The highest level of <laughs> of competition, like the stakes could never be higher uh, and your whole team's sick. There were serious discussions with management um, that they had, evening. They were like- They, ha they had to have the meeting in the general manager's room because he yeah. was too sick to leave his room. Yeah, and they were, they were saying, hey, like we might have to call and tell them we can't compete like we might we might have to call the like call it off we're we're like look what's going on here and a decision in that room was made like no we will we will it doesn't matter there's not a chance that we don't take the field no matter what uh and that just goes to the like the competitive spirit of the all blacks they're just like no no matter what we'll be there like but hey, i'm not i'm not leaving my bathroom floor yeah you want me to fucking play in the rugby world? I'm gonna leave my bathroom floor. I'm crying. I'm in the fetal position, crying. Oh yeah, coming out both ends. Yeah, right. The no. garbage can and the toilet are full, and I'm fucking miserable. Yeah. Right. Like this is, but see now, like again, like let's get on the train. We were, I already kind of mentioned, but we'll talk food poisoning. And one of the one of the crazy things about food poisoning is the fact that one of the senior members of the um, of the management team who kind of organized all like the hotel stays and everything. They, they said basically the, the planning for the World Cup campaign was so detailed 
that management had talked in advance about the possibility of food poisoning. Like this has already been something they talked about. This was in their head. Yeah. Like well, there is potential for that. So that was one of the reasons why they were like, there was fucking meticulous planning around where they're going to be eating, right? Where were the safe place to eat? We're going to be eating in the same facility as like as the general public, because you know, how can they tamper our food? Yeah. Right. When the general public are eating here too, they weren't going to be getting private, you know, private dining venues or anything from these, from these facilities. They weren't going to go anywhere. Right. So th they, they went into this trip knowing like, Hey, listen, not only are we getting these death threats and stuff like that, but there is possibility that they might try and poison us. So this is, we're going to stick to this strict regime on where we're going to eat because it's going to be safe. And that evening, one of the things that pops up is that, um, the hotel restaurant where a lot of the team ate, uh, normally they would be with everyone else in the hotel. And that night as they went, um, and they were kind of checking into the hotel, they were ushered and were told, Oh, Hey, everyone with the all blacks is sitting over in this section over here. And we're basically moved to another room, uh, of a restaurant which at the time didn't really raise suspicions for them because they were, they'd eaten there basically all week. Yeah. And like another thing too, that made them feel kind of lulled them into like a, a sense of security. I'd imagine is like, it, it it's still like a diverse menu, right? Like they're like, basically you guys get to choose from hamburgers, chicken burgers, lasagna sandwiches, right? Like that was the menu for the day. Yeah. Right. So it wasn't the same type of protein. It wasn't the same type of meat, right? There was, you know, but they were all given coffee, tea, and milk. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I'll say this, like, if you're going to, like, you know, we've, if you've seen wedding crashers, just a couple eye drops in someone's coffee, right? Like you're sending them for a, <laughs> they don't, they, I don't know. Like that's been kind of disproved. They don't put that ingredient in, in, uh, eye drops anymore. Anyways, yeah, since that movie, Everyone I don't know about well, since the movie, but <laughs> But um, either either way, like it's it'd be quite easy to quickly do a couple drops into a bunch of coffees before you serve them, or into one coffee pot as you're topping the boys up. Well, and it makes a lot of sense too because there was there was a few different players that actually went ate, like they ate at McDonald's. Yeah, right? snuck out. Didn't they snuck sick. out, ate at McDonald's, didn't get sick, and then there were a few other players who were late to the food, missed the food, but still partook in the coffee and water. Yeah, and they got. sick. Now, another thing that I find fascinating is that um, they had actually hired uh, private chefs to come in for these last build for the buildup of these last couple of days. And basically, like these private chefs either no showed or were barred from cooking for them. Um, no one really knows why. Some people think that it was um, this South African like rugby association was maybe giving these private chefs wrong directions or paying them not to show up uh, when hired, but they were collecting money from the all blacks and then just n never showing, which was basically forcing them to eat at the hotel restaurant. Totally, man. Like, come on that right there would have been like, boys, we're all going to yeah. McDonald's. For we're all fucked. We're not yeah. like, listen, I, that's fucking terrifying to me, man. I couldn't imagine. Like, why would that make sense? Like th these guys are on your payroll and all of a sudden they, I, the, Basically, they got no no explanation beyond we're not able to come. That was it. They're just like yeah. they're like, hey, where are you guys? What's the deal? Oh, we're not able to come. Yeah, nothing. And else. that's it. They're like, uh, okay. Now the the other thing that I'll get into is, you know, I want to bring this up right away. Is that the All Blacks never at any point did they come out and say, hey, we were poisoned. But when you look at that game. And, you know, coaches and stuff who have talked to media after they, they point out that some of their best players were like non-existent that game and are, they were just seem like, so not themselves. A lot of, a lot of like, uh, Jeff Wilson didn't even, he got pulled out of the game. He didn't finish the game. Right. Which is super unheard of, especially for a winger. That doesn't make, you know, like a guy who's gets a lot of downtime during a game, who's on the wing should be, be able to finish a match. Couldn't. They have reports like players just like obviously you're going to be sweating, but we're talking like profusely. Oh yeah, like, man, like, you're so sick, right? And you know the the most wild thing about that to me is the fact that they were still able to get this match into overtime, right? Extra like, time. It was by all by no means was it uh, 
like a blowout or anything. Like it was still a close match. And, you know, some people, you know, and me included, think that, you know, had they not been poisoned, perhaps that game wouldn't even have been close. I absolutely. Right? And could so, you imagine, like, you've just, you've got this big, you got Nelson Mandela, right? Yeah. At, at the game, the you leader of your country. Freeman, got Morgan Freeman coming out, and then your yeah. team gets fucking slapped. Well, yeah. I, you know what makes, makes me to wonder, would it have been even worse for them if they won? Yeah. Right? That fucking crowd would not have been happy. No, I, I mean, like I said, it's a storybook ending to that. But. Yeah, I'm talking about the wrong storybook. It's fucking. Yeah. This it's, is. It's it seems to me like like who would do this because obviously this story, tra- again transcends sport. But there now, when you look at this poisoning, there seems to be quite a few interested parties that may have made that happen. Absolutely. Like, I, you want to get into a, a few theories? Yeah, let's fucking do it. So we've got a former uh, top South African police commander involved with the All Black security at the '95 World Cup. Says the team was deliberately poisoned before the finals, and he he, he says he, without a doubt. The um, Rory St- Stein, he was the chief bodyguard formerly for President Nelson Mandela, and he believes that a syndicate was behind the poisoning, and it was all due to fucking betting. Well, and, and on that note, one of the All Black players said that there was a, a, a like someone staying in their hotel with him who was a bookie, uh, like an English bookie, who was basically like leading up, kept telling them like, I hope you guys don't win because if you guys win, I'm belly up. Like I can't afford, <laughs> I can't afford for the All Blacks to win. Uh, the amount of payouts I would have to do, I would be ruined. And, and like, here's the thing for me too. It's like, so... Let, let, let's get on the topic really quick of food poisoning, right? How many times have you, let's say, whatever, we go out, we, every, you're with a group of people, you share a meal, and one or two out of fucking five or six people get super sick with food poisoning, right? And the, I've never, like, you must be eating some seriously rancid shit because a lot of times, like, people people have stronger constitution, right? They're able to digest a little bit better or, you know, it just doesn't hit. Maybe I had a little bit more of the fucking spoiled food than, than another person. I'm sicker. But when it takes out 80% of the people, yeah, 80% out of that leads me to believe that there was something like, de- not just food something poisoning, like deliberate it. poison. Yeah. Right. Like that's wild to me. But like I was saying, some people on the all blacks question, they're like, they were like asking, they're like, okay, who the fuck is this bookie? And why is he allowed to keep telling us how if we win, he's ruined? Like, keep him away from us. What the fuck? Absolutely. Is he? Like, it's why is problem. this? Yeah, like, what, don't make your problems my problem. Yeah, why is this guy off? here doing this? Like, this is absurd. So, I could see that, right? Like, I mean, they seemingly had access. Now, the hotel staff was quick to come out and be like, point the finger at everyone else. No, 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 this couldn't have been us. Had nothing to do with us. Um, well, they even they went as far as after the All Blacks left because they know that the story starting to leak. After All Blacks left, they went through their fucking rooms and their garbages and they found a few bottles of this peri peri sauce, which I think it's like a spicy fish sauce or something. Fish sauce or chicken sauce, I'm not sure. And they found this and they actually had it tested. And they're like, oh yeah, that's right. Like it's it's got some fucking contaminants in it. This is why they were poisoned. And it's like, first of all, you've had this sauce sitting in a fucking garbage in a room for how long? Of course, it's grown some fucking, you know, some type of fucking fungus in there that's going to be causing people to be sick. And second, like, do you think 80% of these guys had those fucking bottles? Had this fucking chicken sauce? They all, you know, like that doesn't even, just seems like a fucking cop out to me. My issue is what, what is it? The fucking four season CSI team coming in? Like yeah, exactly. this isn't a law enforcement agency. It's a fucking hotel. You know what I mean? How are those Perry Perry bottles collected? Right? You know what I mean? Like there's there's no chain of command of, of whether these things were tampered before they got tampered before they got any testing done. To me, it, from a hotel standpoint, anything other than we had nothing to do with it seems super fucking guilty to me. When you're rummaging through the team's garbage and shit, and you're like, yeah, we we found all these bottles, and I'm like, no one brought the bottles of Perry Perry sauce with them. Yeah, I want to be like, listen, this place, like these these hotels, like we got to get behind this because people are going to think it's not safe to stay here. Our food's fucking unhygienic or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, another thing that really jumps out at me is um, at the All Backs training session on, thir- on Thursday morning, so the morning before everybody started getting, you know, the symptoms, 
Before returning to their hotel for lunch, Frank Bunce picked up a water bottle, took a sip, and threw it to the ground complaining about the taste. Rob and Brooke then took a tiny sip from the water and said, like, this water tastes like shit, right? So his brother, Aziz and Brooke, threw the bottle to the team doctor, Mike Bowen, and saying, like, this doesn't taste right. Something's wrong with it. As that happened, the Thursday practice was the only occasion on which Bowen had not himself filled the bottles with distilled water, hmm. right? So the team trainer didn't fill these bottles himself. Who the fuck filled them? Yeah, interesting. Right? So either this is where the guys got poisoned, maybe at the fi- like at the practice, the training session with their water, or maybe this was a first attempt at poisoning them. And then they followed up with another poisoning attempt. So even another, and this, this to me points to a, a guilty party. Now, um, the SAIU, is that the South African Rugby Association or whatever? I, the, I, I can't remember. I think it's SARU or SAIU. Uh, and is it doc, Dr. Lake or Dr. Light who's in charge of it? Super fucking racist guy. Seems Oh, that guy's a piece of shit. Man. Yeah, 100% piece of shit. Um, people like people <laughs> referred to him being like working for him. They're like, it must have been like working for Hitler. <laughs> like, that's oh, yeah. what they said. Like the shit he would say. And after, so after the World Cup, there was like a big dinner and big ceremony. And he basically stood up and was just fucking insulting the All Blacks uh, at the World Cup dinner to the point where the All Blacks stood up and fucking left. They yeah, walked I- out. Of the ceremonial dinner. I'm going to butcher the dates, but I believe he's like, basically when he's on the mic, he said there were no true champions in 90 or in 88 and 91 because South Africans weren't there. Yeah. Because they weren't allowed because they they weren't. Yeah. (laughs) Because they were fucking part of the, you know, they were racist. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Like essentially there was no, you know, there there was a team full of white guys. But like, that's wild to me. Yeah. Right, and the he, All Blacks got up and fucked off because you like this is the All Blacks like Joan Alamu, one of the best rugby players in the history of the fucking world. He's he's fucking indigenous, right? He's yeah. uh, Maori. If I'm hopefully I'm not fucking that up, but right, like there, you know, there are a bunch of white guys on the on New Zealand too, but they're they're like literally indigenous like yeah players. And could you imagine sitting through that and listening to that guy? Well, no, because and neither did they, because they stood up and they fucking left. They were like, fuck this guy. We're out of here. They left. Now, afterwards, as the story starts leaking, and it leaks, it gets out in the press first. And again, the All Blacks never made an excuse for the loss. They never said, oh, we were poisoned. That's why we lost. They never said shit. It's when the media got a hold of it that they started asking questions of, uh, you know, the the coaches and stuff and, and, and people involved in the team who were like, yeah, we we uh unfortunately we believed we were poisoned 48 hours before now representatives for the south african team and this to me points to a guilty party they've said they've come out and said hey yeah the all blacks should stop complaining right no one cares that they were sick there's no proof of that in fact our guys were super sick too 48 hours before they all had food poisoning too you didn't hear us complaining about it there's never been one account from anyone on that south african team to cooperate that their whole team had food poisoning. But that is the official, that's the official like response to, Hey, we're the all blacks poison. It's like, yeah, so were we. Well, it's crazy because they went like they hired, they hired uh team private investigators to go through and just, just to try to get to the bottom of what happened. And supposedly that private investigator found a, uh, he learned of a herb known as the Indian tick, which produced all the classic symptoms of the common stomach book. The herb was a flavorless and odorless spice, which was easily added without those knowing, basically. So you could sprinkle that shit into food and people would have no idea, right? And this private investigator, obviously this person was hired by New Zealand, um, says like there, there's co- like there's there's almost definitive proof that the water and the coffee were spiked. Yeah. And supposedly a hotel waitress named Susie admitted to be to putting this Indian tick in their drinks. Now, we, I'll say a little caveat to that is, while it's been widely discussed about this Susie admitting to taking a payoff and putting this substance in the food, no one knows where Susie is. No one can find Susie. Sounds Susie, like a fake name. Susie's probably dead. Yeah, or it's a fake name. <laughs> yeah. Random. 
you know, like think about it, like how they probably listen, they probably hired extra staff. Oh, right? without a doubt. Seasonal, seasonal staff. staff, yeah. Yeah, well, and you've got an entire fucking rugby team. You got 37 dudes. You know, got this big influx of people that are going to be standing here and the rugby players are going to be eating a lot more. You know, athletes brought in an additional staff. She shows up for work one day. The next day, she doesn't show up. Why? Because she got paid off. And, the, you know, what? I'll, I'm, I'm going to point another finger that this is pure speculation. But pure. I don't put it past Nelson Mandela's government to do this. And I can't, I know, I know this is controversial, but hear, hear me out here. Right. And, and I'm not saying Nelson Mandela had any part to it. Right. Whatsoever. But the second he starts backing the team and he's saying like, Hey, I want to use this. And he's saying his goal of, we can use this team to unite. Do you not think there was other closed door meetings of like, this needs to happen. How can we make this happen? This needs to happen. Right. How and you know what? It, it just need, they need that win. We need yeah. this win. And like, because, like, think about he goes out and he does all these saying, all this stuff, and they fucking lose. Could you imagine that? Right? It would have been a fucking travesty. Not only do they lose, but they get shit kicked. Yeah. Right? right? Like, think about it. Like, New Zealand was fucking making easy work of every other team that they came they came into contact with. Like, it was – and then and then let's say they're not even poisoned. They're just – whatever. They didn't get poisoned, but just miraculously 80% of this fucking team is violently ill. 36 hours before the fucking the biggest game of their lives and you barely beat them. Yeah. Barely. You beat them by three points. Yeah. In extra time. Right. So I'm thinking like, if these dudes are healthy. Right. But I, like I said, I don't like, put it past like, you know, I know they've been other, maybe, tied to other crime syndicates, but even that, even that, even if say government officials are approaching, you know, underground organized crime and, and betting lines and saying, Hey, like, listen, we're with you. Well, it's not even it's not even that we're with you. It's it's the fuck. Hey, make it happen. I don't care how you fucking make it happen. Just make it happen. Yeah. You can. You got a way of making us win. Just do it. I don't. Hey, listen, earmuffs. I don't want fucking. Doesn't matter to me. Just, you know. Or not only that though. Think about this. Not only that. Like let's say you you're talking Mandela. It's coming from the from the highest of the high because this is huge. Like you're like this is the biggest sporting event that the country has and they're hosting it. It's huge. But at the same time, right, it means so much to the people as well. Mm -hmm. That what, Who's there to say that somebody working at this fucking restaurant is like, listen, fuck these guys. Springboks are going to take this. They're my team. I love it. Rugby's my life. I want this victory more than anything. Why don't we help the boys out? Why don't we help the boys out? And just one person randomly decides. Dude, even that single guy that some of the players – the British guy that said we're telling coming up to them and saying like they, he hopes they don't win because he's ruined if they do. I mean, that one guy pays, pays someone, you know, this Susie or a temporal worker, a, a boatload of cash to save himself hey, from a boatload of coach. You, you've got a, a server working minimum wage job. Yeah. Okay, I'll give you a thousand bucks. But see the reason, the reason why I kind of point, I lean to that. This had to be bigger than just one person is because all of a sudden, you know, all these workings, you know, kind of stopped and like their security detail with the, the process for the hotel was if calls came through, it would go to a switchboard, like a singular security officer who would then clear the call to go to the rooms. That was the procedure that was followed all the way up until five days before the world cup. Then all of a sudden that stopped. The security That's officer awesome. wasn't getting the phone calls. Those phone calls were going directly to rooms with, uh, all black players in it, right? So it's a, it, it, so you had someone either working the hotel that was just punching it through. Um, you then had people on the outside parking cars and setting off alarms outside of all black players' rooms all through the night, right? So it's, to me, it starts to seem like a coordinated effort. You have the news fucking announcing where they're staying. Like, come on, like it's unbelievable. You're you're basically stacking the deck in favor for your team because you know i guess even even just by doing that like the news saying that where they're staying it's like you're basically pointing an arrow to the crazies to be like you're, you're basically at every turn trying to set something up that someone's going to interfere i can see the justification so easily just basically saying we need this more than you yeah we need this more than you they it's, it's just bigger than rugby for us right now that we need this more than you 
right? And that's the and that and a lot of people, a lot of people say that's the reason why South Africa won. They don't, they don't, you know, whether the because <laughs> the poisoning thing doesn't come up a lot. You have to look for it. It's a lot of the you know lovey dovey documentaries that follow the '95 World Cup fail to mention that the team was. Oh, you are talking about there wasn't themselves. there was no segment in fucking Invictus where the boys were drinking spiked coffee and water and they're shitting, <laughs> shitting yeah. and puking. No, listen, I don't. Hey, it might just be because we're conspiracy stooges, but I'm without a fucking doubt. You get you've given me more than enough information. These guys were. 50%, even if just as little as 50% of the team had these symptoms, I would be like, you know, even just the star players. And I would be like, hey, something's up here. Well, but like 80%, you said, 80% of the team. And that's a crazy thing is food poisoning. Like while it happens. Yeah. But like to that many people, all at once, the only people that weren't affected were at McDonald's. But it had no part of buddy, the dinner, coffee or food. Me and you shared a fucking large bag of Rogers Arena popcorn yeah and only one of us shit our pants yeah me you <laughs> and it was bad it was but you that's it I mean? that's going to say like i like sick violently ill and you totally fine and right it's but it, that and that's what happens with a lot of times with food poisoning where it's like you know one or two people out of a group are the ones that get really sick might some people's stomachs might be a little bit off but we're talking these guys were as violently ill as can be from food poisoning mm-hmm like, ah, oh man, I don't, I cannot believe that this isn't a bigger story. There, I just think there's, there's too many conflicting reports. And then the main, I think the main driver that don't want to ruin this, the storybook fucking ending well, no, for the, honestly, and honestly, f the South Africans, you know, good on you had a win, but the reason why this isn't a big story is because the all blacks don't make it a big story. They've like it. You you'd be hard pressed to get uh, information from players that played. They they took the loss. They took the loss. It's an L. It is what it is. The other team won. Now whether that be because they kind of knew like when they lost, like hey, you know what? This is in the grand scheme of things, this is a little bit bigger win for them than it would have been for us. But they don't come out and say, hey, we were poisoned. Managers, coaches, you can find interviews. Team personnel, you can find interviews. But like players themselves are pretty nah. tight-lipped on it, right? Crazy. Uh, and I think that just goes to show the competitive spirit in the All Blacks. But <laughs> wild story. Uh, again, you know, we start to look at these big or organizations uh, on the show. We've we've talked about MLB, NBA, um, and like the shady, shady dealings and stuff. And then it's like, you know, you have like the world cup of rugby, like the biggest tournament and you have this kind of shit going on or even alleged, alleged going on that you start to think when you look at these big things, you're like, why not? There are all these big major organizations are having these issues. Why not rugby? Why not MLB? Why not NBA? Like, it just makes you think that, uh, the corruption in these kind of things is, is widespread, deep seated, and a lot of times you just don't hear these stories. It's crazy, man. I'm just happy nobody died. Yeah, right. Imagine like, playing playing fucking rugby in that heat after being severely dehydrated. Severely dehydrated. Like what well, Paul, even slipping a little too much and imagine a couple players died before the game. Right? Like yeah. it's it's um it's shady, right? And it's it's hard to really point a finger at anyone because you don't know um, who it's, you know, it's a whodunit, but there's so many people that, you know, would have benefit, could have benefited, had the opportunity um, to do it. So it, it's, it's hard to say, you know, at the end of the day, do I think the All Blacks were poisoned? 100%. Uh, 100%. There's a great, uh, there's another podcast who talks with a lot of team personnel called the Rugby Pod. Uh, and they have uh, a, a, an episode Packed about with it. awesome interviews. Yeah, which just interviews like with people, people involved. Yeah, and yep. it, again, if you look into this, you take some time, and you don't think they were poison. Let us know why. If you're just a big Springbok fan uh, and fuck the Albrox, let us know. Um, you can find our show Sports Con Pod on Twitter, Sports Conspirators on Instagram and TikTok. Um, Maybe we should set up a Facebook page or something too. I don't know. 
Let's do it. Yeah, well, maybe we'll we'll set some up there too. Uh, anyways, you can re- reach us anywhere there. Give us a follow. Um, let us know if you like the show, and if you do, please go to Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcast, and give us that five star review. It really, really helps the show, uh, and it means a lot to us. Andrew, anything else before we uh, shut this one down? Uh, yeah, just uh, be careful where you're eating and drinking. All right. <laughs> Eat at home before major events, okay? All right, Zell, ring those bells. Sports Conspirators. Oh, peace. Thanks for listening to Sports Conspirators. Brought to you by Big Theory Productions. For more shows by Big Theory Productions, search Big Theory Productions anywhere you get podcasts. Audio production, mixing, and publishing by Meteor Sound Studio. Meteor-Recording.com.